Welcome everyone. I'm James Frazee. I'm the Director of Instructional Technology Services here. We're about to tour you through one of our learning research studios. This is Student Services West 2667. Uh, we'll give you a kind of a big pan of the space here really quick. We have some guests I'd like to welcome from the University of California, San Diego, UCSD up in La Jolla who are here joining us. And then some folks from our group here at ITS as well as Professor Matt Anderson, uh, affectionately known here as the father of the learning glass, <laughs> who's a physics professor who's gonna be talking a little bit about some use cases of this particular room, which is a room where we have a learning glass embedded within an active learning classroom. Um, but before we begin, I just wanna say how excited I am to be part of this and how excited we are to be part of this um, second virtual tour um, as part of the Educause Learning Spaces constituent group. Um, I wanna send a special thank you and shout out to both Julie Johnston and Adam Finkelstein for their leadership. Um, this is the second in which we hope will be a long running series of peer benchmarking. And uh, we asked a question previously uh, about whether or not you were able to see the first uh, virtual tour. And we're interested to see how many people were able to do that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. But why don't we go ahead and start just to kind of set the stage on the learning glass by playing a short video that will give you some background on that for us. Matt, yeah. cue the video. Here at San Diego State University, we've been developing a brand new technology for online courses called the learning glass. The learning glass is essentially a transparent whiteboard. It's a device that allows you to deliver your lecture while facing the camera. Sign of the angle theta. The learning glass engages students because it maintains face-to-face -face contact with the instructor. They can see my eyes, they feel connected to the class and to me. Because the learning glass utilizes a glass screen, most people would think you'd have to write backwards, but you actually don't. You can write normally. If you're right-handed, you write normally left to right like you would. And then you just do a flip of the image, which you can either do in the computer, digitally, or you can use a mirror. Once the lecture has been captured, the videos are streamed live and archived online, so students can watch the lesson whenever and wherever they'd like. I think it's a pretty cool program because it allows you to have that face-to-face -face experience with the professor while also being able to look at a board while you're at home, you know, looking at your computer. His pens always work, it's very clear, it's easy to read, and he's always facing you when he talks. There's no time where he's turned away and writing with a pen that's been out of ink for weeks. You can hear him and you can see him every single time, and I like that. A lot of my students that have watched these lectures at home and they said, I feel like I'm in your office hours. I feel like we are talking one-on-one -on -one when I watch these lectures. And to me, I think that's an indication that this is a success. I definitely prefer it to a 500 person lecture because it definitely, even though it's not, it feels much more personal and you know, you can pause the lecture and take notes. It's just much easier, I think. I would recommend it over every online class that I've taken. The Learning Glass has evolved to support the talents of students now and in the future, taking online learning to a new level. Okay, so that's a little background on the learning glass. You saw that in another space here on campus. That was one of our first uh, iterations of the learning glass in a uh, actual classroom setting. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this particular environment right now. I wanna start just by saying that this is not scripted. It's pretty informal. I'd like to encourage my colleagues from ITS and, uh, and from UCSD to join in the conversation. And, uh, and also I would like to encourage the audience that's out uh, on the ether to um, enter questions in through the Q&A. We'll have an opportunity at the um, end to go through those questions and we'll try and hit some of those along the way as well. I wanna encourage the people who are here in this room to use the um, touch to talk on your microphones so that our um, audience that's uh, visiting us from a distance um, we'll be able to hear everything you say. Um, and I might as well point this out. You know, in this room we have um, wireless touch-to-talk microphones. 
I'm going to turn it off so I don't get any feedback in it. Um, this is a Sure device. I also want to point out that um, all of the um, parts and pieces in this room are laid out in FlexSpace. If you don't have a FlexSpace account, I would encourage you to use FlexSpace.org, not only to check out um, information from other institutions about their active learning classrooms and other innovative teaching and learning spaces, but also to contribute your own as part of our effort to save time and money. Uh, one thing that I want to point out for um, the two spaces that we'll share today here from San Diego State, we've got line drawings, we have spreadsheets, we have parts lists, we have images, we have videos. In some cases, we have um, peer-reviewed um, scholarly journal articles that have um, come out of work that faculty have done in these spaces. So really want to encourage you to um, go to FlexSpace. In fact, um, before we get into kind of the nuts and bolts of this room, um, I'd like to ask you a couple more polling questions really quick just to get some data back from you. So, and before I do, I want to introduce Oz or the man behind the curtain, Mark Pastor, our associate director. If we could cut to you, Mark, just so they know who's kind of calling the shots behind the scenes, that would be helpful. Hi, everyone. And Mark is up. Hello, Mark. So, Mark, why don't we ask uh, a couple questions about FlexSpace really quick, and then we'll get into some of the parts and pieces here in the room. We'll give you just a minute to do that. And do you folks at UCSD have uh, FlexSpace accounts? Yeah, great, great. Yeah, we really want to try and get more people contributing to that, uh, that database and repository of great examples and effective practices. And, and I also want to say, uh, while people are responding to the poll, that um, if you were able to see the Indiana University uh, Media Center tour, um, if you're anything like me, I'm, uh, I was kind of torn. I, I felt inspired yet somewhat depressed after um, tuning into that because um, they had so uh, such a wealth um, literally of, uh, of uh, funds to, to make such a, uh, a stellar um, space or spaces. And uh, what you'll see here at San Diego State is maybe a little bit more on a shoestring budget. So you'll see that um, our budget uh, isn't exactly the same. And we tried to, uh, tried to maybe um, uh, be as cost effective as possible with, with the uh, purchasing we did. Um, which is actually a great way, if, if we can come back now from the poll, um, to talk about some of, the, some of the gear in this room. So, for instance, um, along those lines, um, we're here at the learning glass. Um, this is a, a rather large uh, piece of tempered shower glass um, with embedded LED strips. Um, and, you know, when I talk about trying to be cost effective, for instance, the pen holder and the squeegee holder here, um, we printed out on our 3D printer. Um, and uh, these are fluorescent lights. If we were at IU or Stanford or somewhere like that, we'd probably be using LED lights, which would be what we would recommend, not only because they're more green and you don't have the harmful gases associated with the, the uh, fluorescent tubes, but it's also much more cost effective and energy efficient in the long run, but they're more expensive. So we've got fluorescent lights here. I don't know, Matt, if you'd like to say anything about the device here itself. Um, I know we made some upgrades over the winter break, um, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that and any of our guys, if you want to talk about that too. Sure. Yeah. You saw James just playing around with the, uh, the dimmer on the LED which is really key to getting a good image. You want to balance a couple different lighting issues. You want to balance the lighting of the lecturer. You want to balance the lighting of the glass itself. And then you want to balance the aperture on the camera. Those three things, if you have the ability to play with those, you can get really good image. Um, like James said, this is shower glass. It's, it's low iron shower glass. You need to get low iron because otherwise all the light gets absorbed in the glass itself and you won't be able to see your image. I'm a physics professor, so I always like to talk about the physics involved here. But basically, the light is totally internally reflected in the glass until you put something on it to frustrate that total internal reflection. And that's what these pens do. You need special neon fluorescent markers that really pops out, makes them nice and visible. And then the, uh, the other trick, of course, is the horizontal flip of the image, right? We're writing this stuff 
normally left to right, flip the image horizontally and off you go. Yeah. So some other things we want to point out here in this space are, um, well, if you come back here with me, um, you might hear me refer to Ethan. Ethan's the man behind the camera here. Um, you can see uh, that we have the, the primary camera as a black magic camera. Again, details on this are on our Flexspace site. Um, we have this in the back of the room. We also have a, a small confidence monitor over here, as well as a secondary Sony uh, camera that we use as well. Um, this actual uh, confidence monitor that you see up here is going to be replaced with a secondary confidence monitor um, that's going to be larger and situated closer to the learning glass um, as part of our uh, digital overlay. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. I want to point out that um, the tables and chairs in here are all movable, so the instructor can reconfigure this and adapt this depending on what they're uh, trying to do with their students. Um, you can also have multiple sources on multiple displays in here thanks to matrix switching. We're actually using Extron hardware to do that. Uh, so for instance, an instructor can have their uh, website or PowerPoint or uh, whatever software that they want to be sharing from a computer source. Uh, on one display and then the learning glass on another. Oftentimes what they'll do is, um, if you turn around here, uh, Ethan, they'll have the learning glass uh, display at the tables and then they'll have their computer source or PowerPoint or what have you up on these displays behind the instructor. Um, let's walk around here and take a look at the actual instructor area. This is a, a, a pretty standard setup for us in terms of the instructor station. Um, we have a, a smart symposium, which is a touch sensitive interactive display. Uh, many of you are familiar with this with a stylus. Um, it's got an ergotron arm so that you can adjust that depending on whatever is a comfortable height for you. Um, we put it within reach of the learning glass. So if an instructor wants to bounce back and forth between PowerPoint, they can do that. Um, we have in all of our uh, classrooms, hundreds of classrooms here on campus, um, a, both a Mac and a PC computer. I know that's somewhat unusual. I know at UCSD you rely on uh, the faculty bringing a laptop computer. Here, um, and this is a cultural thing, um, we started that way and so now I don't think there's any going back. Um, I say Mac and PC with a wink because they're actually both Mac mini computers. One boots into Windows, the other boots into the Mac operating system. We feel it's really important for the faculty to be able to use their native operating system. And we also have connections, both VGA and HDMI connections uh, for an instructor to be able to, and we'll get into that more in the other room, to be able to use um, their mobile device uh, as well as wireless. Uh, audio and visual connectivity. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. I know I use using Mersive, we're using Mersive and Apple TV. We're actually providing kind of a smorgasbord of different technologies. Um, we're also using Miracast. Miracast is built into the Blu-ray players we use in our classrooms. So people who are using Androids can use that. They send their wireless audio and video through the Blu-ray player. That's an option as well. Um, but like IU, we're really hot on Solstice here as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that and the Internet of Things as we get into that other space. Um, here in the Learning Glass Studio, one thing I want to point out is the one button recording capability. So not only can you come in here with a live studio audience and have that really rich, dynamic interaction uh, with students, but an instructor can come in here and just record something that may be more supplemental. They just simply bring a flash drive. We can provide them with a flash drive. Um, they plug it in, hit record, start their learning glass recording, press stop, and they pull out their uh, thumb drive and they've got an MP4 file on that that they can plug into the learning management system, put on YouTube, whatever they want to do with that information. And we'll talk, we have a little video on that that we'll show a little bit later. Um, Matt, you want, want to come up and share some of your use cases? Sure. Um, and while Matt's getting ready, I want to point out um, that we've added a video data projector for computer overlay, um, and we'll explain a little bit about that as we go. And I also want Antonio to help me remember to share an example of, um, and we'll do that just in a little bit here, of how we're using this um, to support an international program we have with Georgia. And that is not the state of Georgia, but the country of Georgia, where we actually have a satellite campus. So we'll talk a little bit about how this learning glass fits into that. 
uh, with both computer science and computer engineering. Uh, so Matt, I know you've got some sure. stuff to share, so please have at it. Yeah, let's go back to the deck and uh, I'll show you guys a couple things. Uh, first off, I wanted to show this picture because everybody's familiar with this idea. When I first got my smartphone, I said, I'm gonna make videos for my students. And uh, I put it on my desk and I stood in front of the whiteboard and I did little physics derivations for my students. And my students absolutely loved it. They loved these videos. They wanted more content, more stuff. And I absolutely hated these videos, right? The, the picture wasn't great. My back was to the camera. The audio wasn't great. And so this was one of the motivations for developing Learning Glass was I wanted a new way to put videos online and still have my students be really engaged. So um, let's jump to here. Uh, I wanted to say about the video, uh, James and his team put together that wonderful video. Uh, the first thing they did was get students involved and those students immediately brought a smoke machine in to the studio. Usually you wouldn't have a smoke machine in your learning glass studio. Um, so this is the space that we are currently in right now. This is what it looks like. As James said, we have a, a big eight foot glass up in the front. We have movable tables big high definition monitors all around the edge. Uh, one thing that we've been doing is we've been teaching what we call a 95-5 blended version, where I will take maybe 20 or 30 students, have them in here, and then the rest of the students will be at home watching online. So in a class of 300, I would rotate that 20 or 30 students in during the semester, and we would pipe the, the, the stuff out to uh, the internet, kind of like we're doing right now, and that's a way to really sort of get your students engaged. You've got live students right here that are asking questions and the students at home can then relate to those questions and they feel a lot more connected. So uh, one thing that's really key in, uh, in doing Learning Glass projects is you've got to get the students involved. You've got to get them out of their seats. You've got to get them engaged and motivated. And so I will often recruit students to come work on the glass demonstrate to their peers how to do a lot of these things. So here's a couple of my students working out some physics problems. And then I also wanted to show this little video of the K through 12 students working on the glass with one of our math instructors, Randy Phillip. So you're looking at this castle. This is kind of an upper view of the castle. It's broken up into all these little segments. And you should not be playing in the border regions of the castle. Two different ways to tell me how many regions are on the border. So I'll be, let's just count. Okay, you wanna count with me? And maybe? One, One two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven eight, eight, nine, 10, 11, 11 12, 13, 14, 14 15, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 20. What? One, two, three, four, five, six. Interesting. Can you talk to me about that? I don't get that. Okay, well. I get it. We have to figure out what there is to get. Come, I get it. May I, may I, I'm, I'm going to take an idea from, from Ava. Eva. Eva, sorry. <laughs> okay, so those two girls happen to be my daughters. Uh, and one of the things that I really like about that video is you can see that aha moment happen in real time. You can see her eyes light up when she realizes her algorithm was wrong and something about counting is very critical there. So it's a nice way to really visualize what's happening in that thinking process, which I think is important. The other thing that we've been doing lately at San Diego State is we've been incorporating Learning Glass into the auditorium setting. So this is my freshman physics class. I have 500 students in the class. Down at the front, I have a small portable learning glass. I put the camera, I sit behind the glass, I deliver my lecture on the glass, and then it projects up onto the giant 20-foot screen so everybody can see it crystal clear, even from the back of the room. Not only can they see all the writing very clearly, but they can see my face and everything, all the facial cues that go along with that. This is sort of an interesting uh, experiment. And one of the things that we're doing, which is really fun, is I get students to come volunteer to perform physics problems on the glass. So I say, all right, if you want to do a, a problem on the glass, put your name in the hat, we're going to pull one out on Friday. And if you come up and demonstrate it to your peers, you're going to get extra credit. So this was the very first week when we did it. And I pulled the name out of the hat. 
and I say, Zhao Jun Shi, are you here? And Zhao Jun says, yes, I'm here. I would like to come do it. So he comes down to the glass. I put the microphone on him, and he sits behind the glass, and he grabs a pen, and he looks out through the glass at 500 of his peers staring back at him. And he just freezes for a second. He's like, oh, wow. And then he says, I've never spoken in front of this many people before. Is it okay if I take a selfie? <laughs> So I thought it was really entertaining. So, And you let him take the selfie, right? Of course. OK, good. Yeah, so now, actually, when students do it now, I just take their smartphone from them, take pictures and video of them doing it as I walk around the class, and then just hand it back to them. And so they have a nice little keepsake. Um, so real quick, I pulled my class in this 500-seat auditorium. I said, what sort of presentation presentation style do you prefer? Because I went through a few different iterations with them. I did you know, PowerPoint. I did the document camera, and then I did learning glass. And so I asked them, I said, well, which one do you prefer? You've experienced all of these. 87% said they prefer learning glass over all the other presentation styles. So I, I thought that was pretty convincing. And I just want to mention, Matt, that here at San Diego State, and this, this may be somewhat unusual, um, we have ceiling mounted document cameras in all of our classrooms, especially in the room uh, like you saw in that image, which is, 500 plus seats. Um, we think it's actually criminal to put a whiteboard in there. Um, reluctantly, on some occasions we do, because if you put a whiteboard in there, the faculty will use it. Uh, and almost inevitably, students won't be able to see what's written, not only because the instructor's blocking it from them, but also because if you were to go to the edges of the room or the back of the room, um, you would see that it's not nearly large enough. So we put uh, ceiling mounted document cameras in. You'll see this in one of our other spaces we'll see uh, in a little bit here. Um, and that helps. And we actually provide a height adjustable um, writing surface so the instructor can main, maintain eye contact. And even with these ceiling mounted document cameras, uh, and I want to make a plug for Wolf Vision because they have been um, incredibly reliable. In fact, I think we might have stole the idea for the ceiling mounted Wolf Vision from um, UCSD and uh, a trip to the med uh, department out there. But anyway, um, even with these high end, uh, very high resolution document cameras, it, the students preferred the learning glass. So just wanted to, to mention that. Matt. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, the, the document cameras are fantastic and, and I love using them as a backup, but I am sold on learning glass. I can't go back. Uh, James uh, sort of alluded to the, uh, the fact that we are also looking at efficacy studies here at San Diego State. And uh, we've been uh, taking this on for the last couple years. Do the learning gains match what you would get in a traditional face-to-face, -face, even in a learning glass, predominantly online setting? And the end result is yes, they do. Uh, what's really interesting is if you give them a, a poll about their sense of immediacy, their sense of connectedness to the instructor and to the course, it turns out it's actually higher in an online learning glass environment than it is in a face-to-face -face auditorium setting, which is sort of surprising because your face is virtually there on their computer for you know, a good chunk of the semester compared to them seeing you every day in a face-to-face -face environment. It makes sense though, right? I don't know who coined the phrase distance learning, the original distance learning, but that's what the back of the auditorium is, right? When they are 200 feet away from you, that is the original distance learning. So it's not too surprising that they would feel connected to the instructor when their face is right there in front of you on the laptop. Uh, take a screenshot of this. This has some really useful links for you. Uh, James and his crew at ITS has a, a wonderful page uh, and talks all about different um, aspects of the learning glass, including all the build instructions. Uh, the other place you should check out is Michael Peshkin's Lightboard. Michael Peshkin is a friend and collaborator. He developed an equivalent technology called the Lightboard, independent and simultaneously of us here at San Diego State. I'm happy to say that we are extremely friendly, very collaborative. We've written proposals together. He's a wonderful guy. Uh, if you really have uh, trouble sleeping at night, you can go to my YouTube channel, which is professormattanderson.com. I've got 400 videos of physics lectures there. And then uh, finally, if you want to check out our new little startup company we're actually making and selling Learning Glass products, that's learning.glass. And I want to I just chime in there really quick. So 
Um, we provide the specifications as far as the build instructions from our page, uh, its.sdsu.edu. If you go to the Learning Glass link from there, um, you can also choose to buy uh, a pre-built version um, from Matt's company, not affiliated with ITS or San Diego State. Um, and I want to point out that we've been talking with Michael Peshkin about doing a presentation at EDUCAUSE, uh, this coming uh, EDUCAUSE annual conference in Philadelphia. We're hoping to actually do a pre-conference workshop with Michael Peshkin that will be very hands-on. So, so um, come to EDUCAUSE. There so might be a giveaway. Please come to EDUCAUSE. <laughs> We're talking about uh, a Lightboard giveaway slash Learning Glass giveaway. Um, a question came up, and we're going to have a lot of time. Uh, we're going to make sure we have a lot of time for Q&A. Uh, but one of the questions that came up, Matt, was about captioning of mm -hmm. these videos. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can talk a little bit about the captioning process and maybe um, our most recent uh, use case associated with that. Sure. Yeah, so uh, the videos are all hosted on YouTube. We link them uh, with our learning management system. We're using Blackboard here. Um, the automatic captioning that YouTube does is typically uh, insufficient, especially for any technical jargon. And so uh, captioning your videos, especially for the hearing impaired, is really critical. So I have a, a hearing impaired student in my class, and all of those videos are now being captioned properly such that uh, they can read the, the subtitles as we go. Um, I, think it's, I think it's wonderful not only for the hearing impaired, but also for the, uh, uh, the second language learners, the English as a second language learners. So, you know, it's sort of interesting, you know, YouTube is, is amazing for its reach. And when I look at my YouTube channel, I have uh, 900,000 views on a physics channel, which is sort of surprising. Um, only half of those are from the United States. The other half are from India and Malaysia and Japan and France, all over the world. And so having proper captioning on your videos is, is really important. And Matt, I just want to, um, that's a great segue, especially for those students for whom English is a second language here at San Diego State, especially in our STEM disciplines, um, in some cases where the professor is someone for whom English is a second language. I want to um, talk a little bit about, um, jump out of this uh, PowerPoint deck mm -hmm. really quick and pull up, um, Antonio, if you don't mind helping us cue this guy up, um, a media site um, example from this past fall semester that was um, recorded in this room. This room's equipped with media site, um, as are um, our large lecture spaces here on campus. The instructors can tell us, you know, I want my Monday, Wednesday, Friday, nine o'clock class recorded um, or streamed live, um, and we'll inject that right into the learning management system. Um, we can talk about some of the um, questions that faculty have about intellectual property and students not coming to class and how we mitigate some of those things um, during the Q&A if you'd like. But I want to share this video with you and I want to point out that not only in this case, this is a computer engineering class, um, a historically challenging class I might add, where it's not unusual for 40% of the students to have to repeat that class. So a high percentage of what we call repeatable grades. These are Ds, Fs, withdrawals. Um, and the thing that is, you know, strategically motivating us here at San Diego State, I would imagine many campuses across the country around the world, is improving time to degree. So strategically, uh, for us, uh, we're part of academic affairs. I report up through the provost's office. Um, we're trying to improve our four-year graduation rates. And so with classes like this one that you're about to see, this computer engineering class, um, if the students have to take it again, obviously that's a bottleneck. This is a gateway course. That's going to slow down their time to degree. Um, so let's talk a little bit um, after I share this with you about how we're using these media site recordings. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the analytics or some of the kind of digital breadcrumbs that the students are leaving behind them. Um, so let's go ahead and fire this up. Yes. And in this case, the instructors invited a student to the board. And uh, the student is working through a problem, which often reveals common misconceptions that other students have. In some cases, the instructors um, we'll have a pair of students come to the board or a small group of students 
which can kind of soften that a little bit and take some of the pressure off an individual student, uh, which we also like to see and encourage. I want to point out, I don't know if you've got video on me or the actual video, the uh, media site recording, but if you go to me, um, I'm going to show you here um, that the students have the ability to, to jump back and forth okay, between sources here. So we need to specify, don't, don't write your neck. Yeah, thank you. So we okay, need to specify the number of inputs and output, uh, the number of right. outputs, so the correct number of inputs. So I just want to point out here, um, if you look at the, um, the actual recording, it also has a slido.com event number. And that's because um, this particular instructor had a room full of students here in the space that we're in physically right now. He also had an overflow uh, into a, what, 200 seat, 150 seat environment? Yeah. So he would rotate, he had a schema for rotating students through this uh, studio so that they would have more direct interaction, a, a closer rapport with the professor. He would invite them up, give them participation points for working problems at the board. Um, and then he had students in this overflow space um, elsewhere on campus where this was being streamed they could ask questions, so could the students in this room, via Slido. And the nice thing about Slido is that the students could, uh, effectively what the instructor was doing was crowdsourcing the questions. So the students could vote up questions, and so the questions that were most salient rose to the surface. The instructor had a, a graduate assistant in the other environment, which was one of our larger spaces on campus, and they were serving as a moderator, and there was a back channel between that GA and the instructor here in this space where we're at today. Um, kind of an interesting use case. Um, the, the interesting thing about that particular course was it, it was also being made available to students in the Republic of Georgia. Uh, so we have a partnership in the Republic of Georgia. We have a, actually have a physical satellite campus or campuses in Georgia. And uh, so this particular course was also being made available to them. Um, I think that's probably a lot. I don't know, Matt, if there's anything else you wanted to point out um, from the, the presentation you had prepared. I think we're probably getting to the point where we need to boogie on over to the other space. Maybe we should just ask if there's any questions about, about the space here uh, before yeah. we leave this space. Yeah, yeah. Let's go ahead. How about from our guests from UCSD? Um, any questions about this particular room? Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, but to put you on the spot. <laughs> or um, Sean, are you seeing any questions? Or Mark, uh, affectionately known as Oz, uh, any questions from our uh, virtual audience about this particular space? Yeah, let's, let's hear a couple of them. And why don't you put your mic on, Sean? So Stanley Weaver asks, does our captioning program do multiple languages? Uh, that is a great question for Oz. Oz, do you know the answer to that question? And so I, I should mention while Oz is uh, checking his sources that we have a, an instructional materials design specialist, a, a person on our team here at ITS who is a expert in the universal design for learning. He's the person, for instance, that Matt's working with on the captioning of his course this particular spring semester, um, where Matt has a student who's either deaf or hard of hearing, um, which is actually um, kind of a blessing for the other students. That means that we get money from our student disability services to provide automatic sync transcription uh, captioning. Uh, and I believe that's available in multiple languages. Uh, we'll confirm on that one in a bit. We'll confirm on that and we'll get back with you. Uh, but Emily asks if we have any kind of graphic or video overlay in Ooh, the foreground or the background. Great, great question. Um, let's go ahead and I don't know, um, Matt, if you've got something to demonstrate that with. Um, I, I don't know if we have it up right now, but, but the answer is yes. You can do uh, digital insertion of, of your images, right? You just need a video switcher to, to digitally insert it. And then like James pointed out with the confidence monitor, you can then annotate uh, the image itself. So if you do a, a chroma key background on it, you can get that chroma key background off and then you're just remaining with your image. So it's really a nice technique and uh, 
it's not hard to use. It takes, you know, it takes a few minutes to get used to that, that weather man problem and the weather person problem. I'm tr trying to highlight something, but I have to look at the confidence monitor. Yeah, it's really pretty. It's really pretty easy. And that was actually an upgrade that we did in this space um, this winter break. Um, and that's where that video data projector uh, comes into play that you see up on the ceiling there. Um, and then Rudy Arias, who's our project manager here, Rudy, um, we have um, both, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about the technology that um, we've added to make that possible and feel free to chime in anybody else here on the team and some of the and the how we did it on a shoestring initially just to get us off the ground i know we've got the frosted glass uh, option as well yeah and actually maybe uh so you can pull it out yeah. the, uh, you know, uh, well i'll stand up and hold this real quick here but um as james um said we started off in the regular uh recording studio so that was version 1.0 for us. And then here in this room, we moved over to a 2.0. Um, and as Ethan, you want to get that shot of uh, Antonio, that's our frosted glass um, that we created out of plexiglass and it has a special uh, projection film on it. And it took us a um, couple of months to actually air out all the bubbles in it. It's, 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 uh, it's kind of like, I don't know if you guys ever really tend to like a window but um, it's, it takes you know, a good um, window tinting technique <laughs> to get this overlay on it. Um, so once that's on it, um, then the projection actually um, it gets a good, well, not a reflection, but it, it actually um, projects on it really, really well. And it doesn't um, go through you know, the, uh, the, the learning glass, um, harming the instructor's eyes. So, so once that's, that's on, then um, it takes practice to get you know the whole weatherman uh, approach on it um, in here. So we're still experimenting with that. Um, it's not a um, uh, I don't want to say we actually advertise for that uh, for every course that's being taught in here because it's 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 really not meant for um, every curriculum. So um, the projector here as well. It's a six thousand lumen projector. So it's pretty bright uh, projector to be that that close and it's really critical you know, to get those colors to, um, to, to pop out. Yeah, and we can, we can show you what it looks like on here. Um, and while Antonio's getting that fired up, I just want to point out, you know, one of the things while we're, while we're learning as we're going here, we're kind of building the plane while flying it, the confidence monitor that you see me kind of gesturing towards at the back of the room here, um, the, the positioning and the proximity of that is too far away from this screen for the instructor to really be able to see through the glass and know exactly where they are. So we're gonna reposition that uh, in this general area on a, uh, on a pole, basically, and that will allow the instructor to have a better ability to annotate easily. Um, and go ahead, and so, here we go. And so this is, again, unscripted. So we're just throwing up some content. We, um, we have behind Antonio, while that's getting fired up, um, you see this, this uh, material here, this curtain. Um, we're going to add a monochromatic uh, kind of green screen, if you will, back here. One of the challenges, um, Ethan, if you can zoom in up here, is our uh, fire uh, detector, fire alarm which we can't uh, conceal, obviously. Um, so we're trying to figure out how we were originally gonna put a screen back here to um, allow us to um, have a monochromatic background so we could change the background like you would in a television studio, uh, but we couldn't figure out how to do that affordably because once you have to disconnect that fire alarm, it trips all kinds of state fire marshal um, alarms, if you will, and, uh, and there's a lot of costs associated with that but that's coming soon. Um, you can see now the um, overlay of um, some digital content onto the learning glass. I'll step out of the way of it. Um, the instructor can annotate that. Um, in the interest of time, I know we need to go see the other space. Um, I think what we're gonna do is wrap this one up if that's okay. We'll have a lot of time for more questions in the next room we're going to. Um, what I'd like to do is have Oz um, queue up a couple videos because it'll take us probably about uh, seven minutes, uh, five to seven minutes 
to get from here to there. We've got some really uh, interesting content, actually probably closer to five minutes. And today, as it would happen, usually you don't hear rain and San Diego in the same sentence together, um, but it's been coming down in buckets. So um, we wanna make sure that um, we shield our technology on the way over there. So Mark's gonna fire up a quick video and we'll see you in just a minute. Hello, welcome. My name is Aurora Jones and I work for Instructional Technology Services here at SDSU and I work in our learning spaces area. And I wanna to talk today about one of our large lecture classrooms. We are in ENS 280. This room seats just over 500 students and it went through a recent refresh uh, this past summer from everything from the seating to the carpeting, fresh paint, and of course we did a major overhaul on the technology in the room. So I wanted to talk today a little bit about some of the components that we've installed in this classroom. And I want to note that a lot of the components I'm gonna talk about are also available in most of our other large lecture halls here at SDSU. We have a smart interactive flat panel display. This allows an instructor to annotate. So say they go to a website and I can also use the pen of the smart flat panel display um, as my mouse. And maybe they want to mark up a certain website, maybe mark up a document, uh, highlight certain things for their class. They can do that with the smart monitor. The smart monitor um, also comes on an Ergotron arm uh, that I want to mention is adjustable. We uh, take great pride in our accessibility standards here at SDSU. We've included the monitors on a height adjustable arm for a faculty member who might need to adjust it lower. We also have this air touch table that is height adjustable and can be raised and lowered to meet a faculty specifications. And this air touch table has a, a whiteboard surface, which I'll show you in a bit is used in conjunction with our document camera. The document camera is located in the ceiling and pretty much every smart classroom here at SCSU will have a document camera. We also made a, a pretty big upgrade to our switching system in this in this classroom, we installed a matrix switcher. What that allows the instructor to do is to actually show up to two different sources at, on the screens at the same time. So we have three projectors, three screens. So say, for example, they want to show a different source like the Apple TV on the middle screen, they can make that adjustment on our TouchLink control panel, and then they can leave their PowerPoint or website, for example, on the outer screens. It gives a lot of flexibility to the instructor, um, so maybe I'll switch to the document camera and I'll send it to my outer screens. And as you can see, there's kind of a large shot of our document camera on our air touch table. And let me go back to getting that Apple TV back on the middle screen. I also want to mention this room is actually equipped with lecture capture. If you'll notice in the back of the classroom, we do have a camera that's fixated here at the instructor podium. When the instructor gets to class, all they have to do is using our touch link control panel, they can launch the media site area, and then they can choose from one of these four camera presets. Maybe they want to show the air touch table as well as the podium or maybe a, a little bit of a wider shot so they can, move, they can move around freely. You'll notice in our podium, there is a media site confidence monitor so they can see actually what they look like and how their final recording will look. While we're here, I wanna talk about some of the other items we have in our smart classroom podiums. Uh, for example, we do provide both a Mac computer and a PC computer in all of our smart classroom podiums. We want to make sure that the instructor um, can choose their native operating system, whether they're more comfortable with the Mac or the PC. We provide both in all of our classrooms. And we also, of course, provide laptop connections. We provide an HDMI and VGA um, cable to connect their laptop and you know, USB extenders, et cetera. So there's lots of connectivity options in our smart classroom podiums. We also take great care to label everything, highlight everything, make it as easy as possible for the instructors to find what they're looking for, the keyboard and mouse, um, what connections are available, and of course labeling 
things like stop and forward on our Blu-ray players, for example. We also provide some wireless microphones in this classroom. And we have several wireless microphone options in case they want to pass them out to the students, if they want to get some student questions or feedback during their lectures. And we also have a stage, kind of a fixed podium microphone that can be placed in the podium as well if they want to do more of a, of a lectern style. Okay, so welcome to one of our larger active learning classrooms. Uh, this room seats about 70 seats. We wanted to share this with you because it's our newest active learning classroom. Um, I want to point out some of the features of this particular space. Um, one is this, and we have these in, in other rooms, a height adjustable um, interactive display. This is an interesting unit. This stand is actually made by a company called Bald Technology. Um, you can use it like you would a drafting table for people my generation you know what that means uh, for people who are not from my generation it's funny i used a um, lifestyles of the rich and famous metaphor earlier before we are all online and nobody got it so i had to transfer to the kardashians when i was referring to the iu spaces um, but this is um, this is kind of like something you can use vertically or horizontally you can adjust it to however you like this is kind of an interesting um, device here. This is the ITS homepage. I can use my finger. I can use one of these um, styluses as well. Um, but I want to start by talking about the control interface. Um, we really pride ourselves in an easy to use control interface. Um, in this case, it's an Extron device. We also have a, um, a mobile version of this that you can use um, remotely from anywhere in the room. I'll go ahead and just fire up the room here. Um, I press a button and the first thing I'm prompted with is, do I want to be in classroom mode or breakout mode? And it's just a really simple way for the faculty to decide which mode do they want to be in. Basically, classroom mode sends their source, whether it be the computer, the ceiling mounted document camera up here, um, or any other of a variety of sources like the DVD player, for instance, out to all the screens. That would be classroom mode. Breakout mode allows the people at each one of these tables, if you look around the room, to be working independently. And one thing I want to note here is that um, all of the screens are numbered, and so we have what amount to pods um, in this particular room. The current configuration is set up for 63, because that's the max enrollment we have for this coming semester. Um, if you look at these two center tables, eight and nine, um, and watch what happens when I go into breakout mode. When I go into breakout mode, what will happen here is that um, the people will be able to use their sources independently. And you see those screens in the center of the room go up. And when those screens go up, the people at the tables on either side will see two HDTVs sandwiched back to back. Um, obviously, if you're in classroom mode, this is not the best sight lines or viewing angles, especially for the people who are seated at table four which is behind tables eight and nine. Um, so this would only be used in that breakout mode. Um, and this is also a bald technology, not doing any product pitches here, but people might want to know what the gear is that's making all this stuff go up and down. Just like this device here that's on a height adjustable stand, um, we also have that same bald technology uh, that's responsible for that lift. It's all RS-232 controls, um, and that's being switched through that Extron uh, control interface. Um, and then the interesting thing, if you, I don't know if we have enough wiggle room for you to, uh, to walk over here with me, um, but I want to point out what's at a typical um, station. Um, and you know what I can do is I can also go to this table. Let's go to this table over here just a little closer. I'll point out also, um, like in all of our classes, we have a height adjustable table. Uh, so somebody who's teaching from a wheelchair can easily teach or somebody who just needs to teach from a seated position. Again, this is a dry erase surface material. It's actually an adhesive material that we can peel up as needed and replace because um, as you'll see here, um, there starts to be some artifacting and ghosting on this material over time, just with, like you would see with a regular whiteboard. So we have gigantic rolls of this stuff. We just peel this off and replace it as needed. Again, that's for the instructor to use 
uh, the document camera. They can also use that to uh, project um, print materials, the document camera that is, three-dimensional objects, um, other props and things that they want to share, an illustration, let's say, from their textbook. But let's come over here and look at one of our tables. Um, this is actually a computer comforts table. Again, I don't say that as a sales pitch so much as just so you know where the gear came from. Um, in this particular table, there is an internal computer um, that's uh, there for students. Um, most of our students have mobile devices, but in some cases they don't, or just in terms of the ease of use and getting them up and going right away, we have an internal computer. Um, you'll see we have a variety of um, I.O. devices for them. Uh, VGA, HDMI, mini display port. Um, and if you come a little bit closer here, you'll see we've got a lot of power options for them. Um, if you've ever heard Kyle Bowen talks, he talks about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I don't know if it's power or Wi-Fi, what's higher, but um, in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we know they need juice for all their devices. So we've got USB, and of course we've got AC power for them as well um, in both parts of the table. Um, they can click on either the uh, computer or uh, a mobile device. In this case, we use the Extron Show Me cables. If something was attached to this, this would light up. Um, these would be in different colors. And then the student who wanted to share what was on their mobile device would simply press that button. I pressed it right now, and it's confused because there's nothing connected to it. Um, so we'll go back to computer. And so um, uh, in this case, um, the tables are fixed and the chairs are on wheels. In some of our other active learning classrooms, everything um, is on wheels and height adjustable. In some cases, they're belly height tables. We know that that can make the interactions a little bit more casual and informal. Um, in some cases, we have telescopic legs on the table, so they can be in a traditional table height or they can be at a belly height. Um, I want to point out something over here really quick. Um, in terms of the sources. So I'm going to go back to classroom mode. I want to point out that um, this is programming that our team, shout out to Antonio and Vaughn and some of the other people who are responsible for programming all this stuff, did with the uh, Extron control interface. We'll go to classroom mode right now. And as you see when I go to classroom mode, it's asking me what source do I want to send to all of these displays. At the same time, if you pivot around, you'll notice that the um, TVs in the center of the room are going down. Again, that's what happens when I go into, quote, classroom mode. Um, and so if you swing back around here to the source, you see, as usual, in all of our classrooms, you have the Mac, the PC, um, Apple TV. This is going to be changed to a more generic um, option. Right now, it's labeled Apple TV because each one of these devices has an Apple TV behind it. Uh, eventually, we're going to move to something that's a little bit more uh, uh, multi-platform and, and agnostic that way. Um, you've got all these different sources that you can switch from. Right now, I'm going to go to the document camera source because I want to share something that you'll see in one of our other rooms. And I'm going to go full board, um, which will allow me to, let me reposition this so that's in the right spot here. Uh, and get that going. And Feel free to get that going. I want to point out when this goes, and it was only a matter of time when the technology would not cooperate. We always say it's when, not if. Um, so typically you have here, if we zoom in on the control interface, um, the ability to save images to memory here, because it's, it's just a camera, and then you can recall those images to memory, which is just a simple on and off. You've got to focus in and out, you've got to zoom, you can let more or less eye, uh, light in through the uh, iris, and then we've got a couple presets for the full uh, board, as well as an eight by 10. And I will point out what I was going to point out, because for some reason the document camera is not cooperating, um, which is a great teachable moment for everybody. Um, this is something in our other rooms where we have um, more flexible furnishings. Um, and basically it's a way, here we go, um, it's a way for us to, um, and I'll switch to the document camera source here, um, now that it's been, you know, this is always the trick, have you restarted it? Uh, so we've restarted it and, and it works now. You've got to believe, you've got to believe that it's going to work. So I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit here. Uh, and then if you see here on the 
you could look at this, um, this here. Um, what we try and do in our rooms where we have more flexible furnishings, and it was raining outside, so this piece of paper um, looks like it's been um, through the rinse cycle, and that's because it was. And then also when we were walking across campus, um, classes don't begin until next week. There was a whole section of the um, campus that was barricaded off because they're doing some construction. So we had to take a little roundabout way. So thank you to Oz for buying us some time. Um, this is basically permission for the faculty to rearrange the rooms in rooms where we have, and we're not gonna have time today to see all of our active learning classrooms. In fact, two of the active learning classrooms that we're most proud of um, are being used for workshops. One is a faculty development workshop that's being led by our Center for Teaching and Learning, and the other is a supplemental, uh, supplemental instruction instructor uh, trainings for the uh, supplemental instruction leaders here at SDSU. These are the near peer students that provide that supplemental instruction. So those two active learning classrooms are being used. One of them is this room, Adams Humanities 1120. And what we say to the instructors is basically by having this in the room when they walk in, we're giving them permission to rearrange the furniture. Um, and you heard Julie say that she was really happy to see um, that all the stuff had been moved around. That way we know it's being used and that faculty are reconfiguring it based on their own needs. And in this case, we point out, build your own. We say, okay, we have these different kind of thought starters for you to let you know some different possible configurations, but we also have a build your own option. And then we're working right now on a guide to choosing room configuration, which is really meant to just be, um, again, a way to get faculty thinking about different possibilities. And um, it's not meant so much uh, to be prescriptive as it is just to be a way to kind of get the juices flowing and expose them to more possibilities. Um, so at this point, um, I wanna turn it over to Rudy and see if there's anything else um, you might wanna point out. Rudy is um, our project manager and has um, really been a key leader here at ITS. All right, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, I just wanted to point out, uh, as usual, um, right behind the camera is our phone. Um, you know, given that we're in such a large space with a lot of technology, um, it's really critical that we always have, you know, and this is, goes throughout all of our close to 200 classrooms, we always have a phone in, in arm's reach. Um, and we, we lay out all the numbers to call. We even created a new acronym so that people can just easily pick up the phone and dial the floor help and we spell it out there. Um, <clears throat> with hours and, and um, uh, hours of our operations, um, we do have special events that uh, are scheduled in here, so um, it's critical for them to know that they're not just calling and somebody's not picking up. Um, LED lighting in here as well is another uh, feature that's really critical um, where we can actually dim the lights. Um, it's also within arm's reach, and uh, as James is sort of demoing there, and that's, uh, we usually have about, um, well in this space it's pretty large, so we have three legs, so we'll be able to dim the front and then the middle and the back. Um, another thing that, uh, kind of a, a lesson learned for us is power in here, and I know James talked about that a little bit, but when we had, uh, this room was actually contracted out, and um, our folks on campus know how much power we use, but when we contracted out, um, they basically gave us like, um, they, they, tie, they were tying in like TVs and, and tables all together into one circuit breaker. And so what happened was on, on the day of, first day of classes, um, students started showing up and plugging in their iPads, all the peripherals and the computers. Well, what happened was it started breaking the breakers. And then that started creating a distraction in the classroom. So um, <clears throat> always look into or even have uh, an electrical engineer kind of, um, you know, review your drawings when you're in here and all the, uh, the power consumption that you're going to be offering. Um, you know, TVs consume very little, but on the table we, uh, we have USB power and also just regular uh, 110 power. Um, <clears throat> we also have the whiteboards on, on easels, or you can actually clip them on, uh, which will create great um, team, team projects or uh, collaboration. Um, you can actually just put them on there and, or you can bring them up here and put them underneath the document camera as well so you can have the group um, you know, come forward and share. Um, the wireless keyboard has also been a, a great feature to have. 
um, where it has a built-in solar uh, panel. So for us that we support uh, these classrooms, um, we don't have to worry about when to change those batteries. You know, whenever you recycle them, it's actually getting powered through these great um, LED lights in here. Um, same thing with the mouses. Um, well, actually, one more thing I wanted to point out. So it gives you the ability to switch between the Mac and the PC, which with the mouse, uh, we don't. So unfortunately, we still have to keep it down, uh, to two mouse or mice. So we have the Mac and the PC. So we like to label everything. <laughs> James is always uh, making sure that we label everything because we may assume as you know, technicians, but it's always the end user that doesn't know um, what is what. Yeah, so an example of that, thank you, Rudy, mm -hmm. is here on this um, height adjustable uh, interactive display. We, we go to great lengths to uh, try and make everything as intuitive as possible. We've got a quick start kind of uh, cheat sheet, if you will, here. Um, and you know this is something that's constantly evolving as the technology is evolving. So you're, sadly, you're never done with these. That's why we make it easy to change them out with these acrylic wall signs here. Uh, because again, it's not a matter of uh, when or if, but it's when the, the technology is going to change. Those huddle boards, the faculty love, the students love, ultra lightweight, super easy to use. They can use that for you know, formulas or you know, modeling, for instance, with Matt's physics content. They can use that for storyboarding. They can use that for a variety of things to get them really engaged in the content. Um, I want to go ahead and um, move us into a Q&A period. Um, one thing that I'm hoping we can do is maybe we can all kind of huddle around these center tables. Um, and I know there's been a lot of questions. We'll try and get to as many of those as possible. We had 90 minutes for today. So we're leaving, I don't know, almost a whole half hour for Q&A because I know in some cases that's probably the most uh, useful use of our time. One last thing I want to point out um, is the ceiling tiles. Um, I always joke around that A comes before V in the audiovisual world and if, acoustically if you can't hear what's being said uh, you're in big trouble. Um, these particular uh, tiles um, have a sound transmission coefficient of 60. Um, 50, 55 is typical, 70 is better. Um, We've got integral color, so if you end up moving those around a lot, they don't get chipped on the corners. These are the kind of little things when you're working with architects and designers and builders that often go under, uh, you know, missed. Um, and there's other things that we've done in some of our active learning classrooms, like putting um, the HDTVs on a diagonal in the corner, especially when we have food-friendly flooring, like we have in here. Sometimes we have polished concrete flooring. Sometimes we have this tile flooring, um, that can be really lively and there can be a lot of reverberation and echo. Well, there's things that you can do uh, to mitigate that with how you position the displays and, the, and some of that gets trapped behind the displays. If you position them in the corners, you can do things with the ceiling tiles. You can do things obviously with the acoustical wall tiles that we saw at IU. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind is that central importance of audio. Um, and so with that said, let's go ahead and Bring it over here to the, um, to the Brain Trust. Um, Cal, I would like you to be over here. Antonio, I'd like you to be over here. Um, we've got our guests from UCSD. Now's your chance um, to, uh, to answer, for us to answer any questions you might have. And just to, if you've got things that you'd like to um, you know, share that you're doing that you think would be worth sharing with the audience, that would be great too. So, um, Sean, you will be our moderator here, if you don't Sounds mind, Sean House, one of our instructional developers here at ITS. Okay, so the first question is from C. Jennings, and C. Jennings asks, um, where is all the physical wiring, et cetera, to enable all the switching that you demonstrated, James? Okay, so the physical wiring in this space um, is mainly overhead um, in, and I'm gonna need an aunt to, to turn to the corner of the room here really quick. Um, we've furred out a wall in the corner um, and that is effectively the nerve center of the room. The, facu the faculty don't typically need to get into that cabinet. They can if they need to. Typically what we'll do is we'll actually put a, um, a cover plate over any of the switching or control interfaces uh, just to keep them um, from helping themselves uh, for the people who know what I'm talking about. Um, 
And we've got physical entrapments for all the gear. One of the things that I want to point out that's maybe uh, unusual, here at San Diego State, we don't require keys in any of our classrooms. So the gear has actually got a physical entrapment to keep it from walking away. Um, but we don't have a key that stands in the way of the instructors using these spaces. And we can, through the Extron control system, we can remotely um, monitor and control these rooms. So we can shut down um, the systems when they're not being scheduled for classes. Um, it's a way for us to keep tabs on um, un, you know, uh, unusual uh, use cases, you might say. Um, but anyway, to answer the question, we've got plenum rated wiring that's going up and over through the walls and down into that nerve center that we pointed out in the corner. And then, and then we've got two cores in the floor. Go ahead, please, Rudy. And, um. Um, so we also had, uh, well, one of the, the expensive ones, uh, and I think everybody knows, is when you start coring floors, you know, you start hitting rebar, you start hitting structural beams. So in the center here, we have, uh, I believe, one or two cores, just one. Uh, I think it was like a pretty big one to get all the wiring down there. And then it gets piped back into that AV uh, cabinet. Same thing with the teacher station. Um, <clears throat> we had a core there and then we had a recess box to make sure that we tried to eliminate any uh, tripping hazards. Um, because the uh, teacher station doesn't have a computer directly underneath it or near it, then we had to extend everything. Like US we have USB extenders. Down lower. Um, we have video extenders as well, just to make sure that whenever they plug in the laptop or whenever they're using the, uh, the, the touch screen table, that it's not losing any video or, um, or USB signal. And the mouse and the keyboards are, are wireless. Excellent. Thank you, Rudy. So Charles Barber asks, does this room have any video conferencing capabilities, or do we rely on Zoom or other technologies for that? We're, we're moving uh, almost exclusively to Zoom. All of our Kodak gear is being, or has been, I should say, phased out in favor of Zoom, um, although we do have some legacy gear if we, we needed that. The, the beautiful thing with Zoom, which is our campus standard, indeed it's the standard within the entire California State University system, is the ability to bridge those older Kodak H.320 uh, interfaces. Um, but yeah, no, we, we rely on wireless. I've seen instructors use FaceTime um, in this room. We have one of our learning research studios. Um, you guys might think of it as an active learning classroom. We refer to them as learning research studios because we really emphasize getting data back. If you teach in one of our active learning classrooms, you agree to survey your students at the end of the term. You agree to, as a faculty member, respond to a survey yourself. And you agree to go to two meetings, and um, one at the beginning and one at the end of the semester. Um, and so anyway, we get a lot of interesting feedback from faculty. One of the faculty members in one of our learning research studios used iPads to um, use FaceTime to interact with a, a guest who was um, interacting at a distance. Um, so. That's, uh, that's just an interesting use case. So. Awesome. So Stanley Weaver asks, will the recording of this webinar be available? And we are recording the webinar. And um, James, do you have an idea of how we'll make it available? Yeah, we'll get that to you folks next week. Um, you know, classes begin here at San Diego State next Wednesday. Um, Monday is Martin Luther King. <laughs> yes, Matt. I classes, better, classes. I run my <laughs> uh, so yeah, so we'll we'll get that out next week. We've got some loose ends that need tying up um, around campus. Things that we've been doing over winter break, making sure that our faculty, like Marty, who just walked in, are comfortable taking advantage of these spaces. Um, so yeah, we got a lot of drop-in training and things scheduled. Um, both today and on Tuesday when we're back from the holiday. So I think probably the middle of next week or, uh, or towards the end of next week, Sean. We'll definitely have that out and we'll send it out to that EDUCAUSE um, Learning Space constituent group. Okay, um, so this is in reference to the learning glass and Emily asks, I keep hearing shoestring budget. Would you be able to let us know what that means exactly? Sure. Um, so the, in the case of the learning glass, the very first one we built, which was in that uh, video that Matt shared with the smoke machine, um, that was, uh, yeah, ten, about 10 grand. And so it was, um, in that case, it was on a, um, an air touch height adjustable table. It was three by five. Um, it had uh, just the basic uh, aluminum framing. It was all homegrown. So part of when I say shoestring budget, 
I mean, because we do all of the design and build work ourselves, you're not paying a designer. You're not paying an AV consultant or a systems integrator to do that work. So that's what makes um, some of these things possible is that we're actually able to do more because we do a lot of that work internally. Um, in terms of that Learning Glass Studio, um, we have some costs on Flexspace for that. Um, we're in the six figures on that one. Um, the last time I checked, we were at about $108,000. Um, almost half of that was facilities costs. So working with the tradespeople, electricians, you may notice that in one of the slides that Matt showed, the room's walls were white, now they're black. Um, part of what we're imagining for that room is that room's also going to be a VR space for us where we're gonna do some augmented reality and mixed reality. We've actually got a partnership with both Pearson and Microsoft with our School of Nursing where we're doing some interesting things around virtual reality and we're gonna use that space to facilitate some of that. We wanted the walls black for that. So the patching and the painting of the walls, um, the flooring, all of that facilities work ends up being almost as much as all of the equipment and technology, and, and, uh, and I should say uh, furniture and technology. So the furniture um, can be quite uh, you know, an, an investment as well. Um, so that's what I mean by a shoestring. Um, in this case, um, we had these um, tables donated by Computer Comforts, um, which was great. Um, we've got kind of a mix and match. In this case, it's a Herman Miller caper chair, um, a steel case height adjustable table, um, we try and um, give faculty and department leaders and academic leaders here on campus kind of a smorgasbord. So then, and, and it's kind of a hook because what we've found again and again, most recently with the School of Accountancy, uh, prior to that the School of Journalism and Media Studies, is the faculty teach in these spaces and then they go back to their home department and say, hey, we need something like this in physics. Um, and I really like those chairs and that table, but not that piece of technology and yes, the huddle boards. And so they, the idea is that this is helping us from a support standpoint figure out what's most effective. And it's also helping those people in the colleges uh, for their, the spaces that they control. Because oftentimes, I mean, this is a campus of hundreds of acres, uh, dozens and dozens of academic units. Um, there's many spaces that they control. We are responsible for the centrally scheduled, what we call here the general assignment rooms. But as you know, like at IU, the media set, uh, school, they have rooms that are just for the media school. And so we want to help those people locally in their particular building or floor of their building with um, ideas. And so um, we try and help them by, by saying, OK, this costs that, that costs how much. And so, and again, we've tried to make that information available as much as possible through Flexspace. Please, yes. Yeah, so I, I saw in the chat, um, Somebody was asking about the shoestring budget as it related to the large auditorium classroom. And that can be very cheap. If you already have an auditorium classroom with a good projector and you know HDMI in and everything ready to go, you can add that smaller learning glass unit with camera and lights for about $5,000. So you can go very shoestring if you're uh, willing to sort of adapt one of your rooms. And when I teach that 500 person class, I have the entire learning glass stored in a closet. I take it out, set it up, takes me about five minutes to set it up. I deliver my lecture. And then at the end of class, I stick it back in the closet. And so there's a lot of uh, options there for, for keeping it on a real shoestring budget. Yeah, and I, I want to mention that you need to have the infrastructure in place. In that particular room, we had the HDMI infrastructure. We have a laser-based projector. It's very bright. Um, and, you know, with the media site recordings, what's great about what Matt's doing, and I don't need that because I've got a lapel mic on. Um, what's great about what Matt's doing and many of our faculty by using the course capture system is they're giving the students the ability to review that content outside of class, the ability to kind of rewind Matt. And the interesting things that, thing that I mentioned earlier is that we can actually look at the viewing patterns of um, how people are consuming that information. And we can even tell Matt, it seems like everybody is rewinding this minute and a half, this 90 seconds of video. It seems like we can get down to that level. Um, and that's really effective for helping somebody like Martin, I'm pointing to another faculty member who happens to be here for some training going, when's the training going to start? Um, so um, it's really helpful to tell them, hey, 
you might want to provide another example or some more supplemental material because it seems like the students are really bumping up against that content. Um, and that can be really useful in terms of improving your own teaching effectiveness. So not only is it helpful for the students for learning, but it's helpful for the teachers in terms of, you know, what are the things that uh, maybe people are strugg struggling with most in terms of the content that you're sharing. Okay, so we have a question from Charles Barbour. Um, this one is probably good for Matt. It asks, um, he, he knows that erasing on the board can be challenging. Um, how does that work during class? And also it seems that you're limited to how much uh, writing real estate you have with something like chalkboards or whiteboards. Yeah, so the, uh, the erasing question is a very good one. The, the glass is certainly harder to erase than a whiteboard. Uh, so we always tell the instructors you get it put a little elbow grease into it and, and dig in. The glass is tough. You're not going to scratch the glass. Uh, but what I like to do in that classroom typically is I will fill up the board with about eight to 10 minutes of lecture. And then I will pose a clicker type question to the audience. And then I will erase the board while they're working on that clicker type question. And that means that they're not sitting there waiting for me to erase the board. Um, and also, uh, when I do pre-recorded stuff, I always erase the board and don't say anything when I erase the board, and that way I can edit it out later, right? So I just take out those segments where I'm erasing the board. Uh, what was the second part of that question? Uh, real estate for writing. Yeah, so the, the goal for that eight-foot glass was really the mathematicians. The mathematicians want, you know, large amounts of real estate to do these very long derivations. And uh, what I'm starting to appreciate is it's not a chalkboard and it's not a whiteboard. Students aren't going to have to see that thing from 100 feet away. They're going to see it from two feet away. They're going to look at it right on their laptop. And so in some sense, it doesn't matter the size of the glass. You just have to adjust your writing. So when I'm in that 500 seat auditorium, I'm writing much smaller than when I'm in front of the eight foot glass because it all scales to the laptop screen. The only difference is the size of the instructor relative to the glass. So when I'm on my little 30 inch portable, my head's really big. It's taking up a good chunk of that screen. When I'm on the eight foot glass, I'm very small. I'm taking up less of the acreage. And so that's sort of important to keep in mind. You can get by with a much smaller glass if you just write a little bit smaller. And one of the things I like about Matt's response to that question, something that we, when we work with faculty to think about how they're gonna use the learning glass with a classroom audience is this idea that when you're erasing, that's the time to ask questions. That's the time to get the students interacting with you. Uh, and it's really important to build those prompts into your thinking when you're starting to think about that particular class. Maybe they don't have any questions, so you ask them a question then, and they have a chance to ponder on it while you're wiping the glass down and clearing it off. Okay, so Jody Scott asks, um, how do instructors schedule the learning classroom, and is there an application process? Yeah, so we have a reservation request form uh, for all of our learning research studios. The Learning Glass Studio is, is one of those. Uh, and so we asked them some questions. We really encourage faculty who may not be uh, necessarily tech savvy to take advantage of these technologies for teaching. Um, it's on a first come first serve basis as far as um, the reservation process. We're really clear about when we open up the reservation uh, request period. So that's very transparent. Everybody knows, for instance, on January 17th, you can start booking your reservations for the next academic year. So literally January 17th of next week, faculty will be able to begin making reservations for fall of 2017 and spring of 2018. We're that far out with these things. Um, there is priority given to faculty who are actively conducting research. And again, this is this emphasis on scholarly teaching and the idea that we're gathering evidence that's gonna inform what we do from a support standpoint. Perfect. Uh, Jay Bland asks if the information on the ceiling document camera is available on Flexspace. Yes, it is. And it's a Wolf Vision. In this case, it's an I-10 unit. It's an I-12 unit. See, I looked <laughs> at the guys to correct me. In our larger spaces, like the video that you saw of Matt in one of our 500 seat spaces, that's a, um, 
C12. So they have different models depending on um, the size of your space. Typically, the I12 is going to work for you. How, how much are those guys? Uh, I think those were about three thousand dollars. Yeah, so about three grand for those. Um, Wolf Vision is the company. Um, in fact, I believe Wolf Vision is um, a sponsor for FlexSpace, so there may be some direct links through that. But yeah, the model of information, cost information, and all that's available through FlexSpace. The two I should point out when you're looking um, up spaces in FlexSpace, the two rooms that we visited today are SSW2667. That's short for Student Services West 2667, which is the home of the Learning Glass Studio. And the room that we're in right now is in our Education and Business Administration building, which is EBA room number 410. So EBA 410 for this one, SSW2667 for that one. If you looked up San Diego State or uh, Learning Glass, you could find them that way too. Okay, Charles Barber asks, um, when using the Learning Glass in the classroom, do you have a backdrop as well? No. <laughs> Okay, and we have, a, we have a question, I think, from Marty, one of our other faculty members here, who's going to be a Learning Glass user, right, this, this spring. Is that correct? Yeah, in, in, right in just uh, one week. <laughs> yeah, so. for you're also in, maybe you could just give us a little background on the class you're teaching. Okay, so I'm, I'm teaching this new systems neuroscience class, which involves a lot of, a lot of equations and a lot of uh, anatomical diagrams. And so for me, the having a whiteboard-like situation that was recordable was, was just the exact optimal thing. Um, I wanted to, and I'm doing it in the 2667, I think, the one with the big, yep. uh, the big room with possible overflow. Uh, so um, the one thing, I, I, when I looked on the, uh, on the web information, there was somebody putting in a stick and just recording the, uh, the, the video onto a stick. Is that possible in that room? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We have a couple different ways to record in that room. One is that way. And um, I'm going to refer to um, one of our, uh, one of my colleagues as Oz here because he's kind of behind the scenes in another building on campus over in the Adams Humanities building. Mark, did you play the um, video that showed the one button uh, recording uh, how to do that? Uh, yes, I did. The just in time video for the learning glass. Okay, great. Yes. So, we can share that video with you. You'll get some coaching yeah, no, on how I, to do I it. I looked at that one. Okay. I, I think I looked at that so one. So yeah. we've got that. And then we also, you can just say, hey, I'm in there on Tuesday and Thursday at 11. I know that's probably not the actual time you're in there, but I'm in there at Tuesday and Thursday at 11. I'd like to also record that to media site, which will record anything you're doing on the computer as well as anything you're doing on the learning glass. And that has a lot of that analytic information associated with it. So that can be really helpful for you. Um, in terms of your own research agenda, in terms of how people are consuming that content, and also helpful for us in terms of, you know, how they're taking advantage of that information. Are they watching it? Um, how long did they spend on the videos? Interestingly enough, um, the attention span, according to a lot of the research we're uh, reading, um, thanks a lot to some of the MOOC stuff that's been going on for several years now, is about six minutes. Um, that seems to be about when um, the viewing uh, declines. So time you, for a joke. Then. Yeah, time for a joke, time to erase <laughs> the board, time for a break, time to kind of chunk your content into those bite-sized pieces. Yeah. So think about providing content, uh, I like to say, in bursts, uh, and, and that really seems to be effective. Okay. We have a question over here from our colleague from UCSD. Hi, thank you. you would, um, both the last Walk through, and then this one you both mentioned the uh, MERV solstice. Yeah. And I wanted to ask a little bit how you're using it, if it's in this room or what, how you're using the technology. Sure, sure. And Rudy, if you could grab the mic. Um, so that that uh, immersive solstice tool is basically a way for people, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, to send their content, audio or visual, from their mobile device um, to the system, the, to, to the environment you're in. In this case, to these displays, to these speakers. Um, which we might want to point out these speakers too, Rudy, now I'm thinking about it. But maybe you can talk a little bit about the conversation that we've had with our telecom group um, yeah. around not only immersive solstice, but the internet of things in general, because I'd kind of group all of this under that same umbrella. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's becoming really popular that everybody's bringing in all these different devices. Um, and I'll give another example, but just to answer your question first about this, uh, the immersive solstice. So we've been r and d it for about like a good year now. Uh, we have it also in a, uh, a journalism lab 
and then one of the uh, the new complex or buildings that are, that are being built for student housing also have adapted um, the solstice pod so <clears throat> the biggest problem for us here uh, at, on campus was just to get it on the network um, if you use it by itself it works you know without having it join the network it works great but um, here or in any other campuses I'm sure you know there's firewall rules um, and registration issues that come come to hand so um, the network guys here on campus were really great to create basically a, uh, a hidden network um, and they call it for the Internet of Things devices so um, it's a network that nobody knows um, that can actually sign on to it. Um, you have to know the name of the of the access point. So once you enter that in, then it doesn't have any registration. Um, uh, um, what do you call it? Um, I guess uh, um, requirements. Requirements. Thank you um, to log in your 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 devices. So last week we just uh, received a glass that uh, I wear that's called a pivot head. So I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that. Um, and, and so uh, we register that through the, uh, those, those wireless, those hidden networks, and it just started working great. Uh, with the Solstice pod, um, like I said, we've been in, uh, using the R&D net for like a good year. And so I think it's becoming a popular uh, device that we're gonna start adapting in other uh, labs and classrooms like um, these types here. And we know it's uh, 1030 and we promise to keep this to 90 minutes. Um, I think we've been able to answer most of the questions. If there's other ones that um, we haven't been able to answer, we'll do our best to send those responses out to the list. Um, just really want to thank everybody here, our guests from UCSD, um, my fellow ITSers uh, for all their great work preparing for today, Matt Anderson. Um, for his time and, and expertise and Marty for your input today. Uh, special guest appearance. Um, just really grateful and looking forward to the next virtual tour. Thanks everyone.